So we yesterday we we saw the IPv6 um, different kind of addresses. So remember we have the link local addresses, the global addresses, the private addresses, what we call ULA. We saw also multicast addresses. So here are all the family of addresses you can have in IPv6. But in fact, in link, in, in link local, you have an experimental category which is called anycast. So what is anycast? Anycast is a kind of address. Is, if you look at one address, you cannot make the difference between anycast addresses and point-to-point uh, -point or global addresses. You have a prefix, and this prefix is on 64 byte, bits, sorry. And you have an interface ID, and this interface ID is also on 64 bits. The big difference between any cast on over global addresses is that you can assign an anycast address to different elements. So, different computer can share the same anycast address. And when you want to... So, the big difference with multicast is that with multicast you will reach... If I send a packet to alpha.1, in multicast, it means that I will reach all the equipment. In any cast, it says that I will reach only one equipment. I don't know which one, but I will reach one of them. So, this is uh, something that is difficult to, to implement or to use because, for example, if I open a TCP connection, I may open a TCP connection with one equipment, and then, if I use the same address, go on another one, and the other one will never know about this TCP connection. Because all the equipment have the same name. So, you cannot use it for TCP. So normally, any cast will be used either to locate one equipment in your network but you don't know where it is, and you will have only one address. Or, to make a query, and get immediately a response from this equipment. So, there is currently not a lot of use of any cast address. One is on mobility, so you, you have seen classes with courses with Nicola about mobile IP. So you know that you have a home agent. And so this home agent can have an anycast address. So this way you don't have to know the IP or the name, the address of the home agent. You use a well-known unicast address. So this is one possibility. And other possibility, but they are still very experimental, is for example to use it with wireless and phone network. I say I want the temperature in this room. I don't know, I don't care about the element that will give me the temperature. So I will send my query to an address, and I know that at this address I will have the temperature, but I don't care who gives me this value. So it's something possible, but until now it has not been uh, really used. Another kind of any cast is any cast of the prefix. So what it mean? It means that here, you have a network and you announce in your network a different place the same prefix. And so when the computer will be here, close to that the place where you do this announcement, then the traffic will go to that uh, network which has the prefix. 
If you allocate it somewhere else on the network, then your traffic will go there. So this is used, for example, for, um, for DNS. So when you want to go on a route, DNS route, then you, you have some... Uh, you, depending where you are, you will have different paths. For example, here it's a trust route from France, and I do a trust route to uh, this address, 2001-500-2F. Column, column F. Okay, so this is an IPv6 address, but you see that my trust route gives me a route to something that is very close to me because it takes 8 milliseconds to reach the equipment. Now, if I am in Hawaii, in Hawaii I do the same trust route, and here I will have another path. I will go to another location. I am still using this address, the same address, but depending on my place on the network, I will go to different locations. So this is widely used for DNS server because when you query a DNS server, round trip time is very important because you have to query a server and you expect the response as soon as possible. So using this kind of anycast, you will reach something very close to you. And the second problem of DNS is that you can have denial of service. Okay. It means that you can have a group of people that generate a lot of traffic to saturate your server. So, here when we are using Unicast, it makes the attack more difficult because, for example, people located in France can only attack the server in France. People located in Mexico can only attack the server in Mexico. So you need more people in a, in area to saturate the interface. And normally this way you avoid global denial of service attack on DNS server. So this is not so experimental. It is used in IPv4. On in IPv6. Uh, yes. In fact, if you look at uh, DNS, you have a primary server and you have secondary server. This is used for two reasons. One is to spread the load when people will query. So here you have primary, here you have secondary. So when you have request, when you can ask one of these servers. So this way, you share the load among these servers. And the other thing is that if the primary uh, is not uh, reachable, then people can use other addresses to get information. So that's the basic uh, way DNS works. But what you can do, for example, you have secondary here, you give an address, and you, in fact, you do any cast on the address. So this way, people that will reach this server, in fact, depending on the location of the network, will reach one of these servers. But this server will be seen, seen with the same IPv6 address, or IPv4. So this way, you share the load, but here it's totally invisible for the user because he sees only one address. We are going to, to see the IPv6 header. So the IPv6 header, in fact, is uh, you will see very close to what we know in IPv4, but in fact, a lot of fields have been suppressed from IPv6 compared to IPv4. So IPv6 is more simpler than IPv4. So we are going to put IPv6 address on it. So address, of course, are uh, four times the size of IPv4. But the IPv6 either is only twice the size of IPv6, IPv4. So a lot of things are, have been suppressed. 
And there is one constraint that we will see in the future. Also, it's that the minimum MTU, it means that your physical level must be able to carry your IPv6 packet and must carry an IPv6 packet with a size of 1,280 uh, 1, bytes. So that's, uh, but we will go back on, on that. So the main idea of, uh, of IPv6 either is to forward packet as fast as possible. So when a packet arrives on a router, the router has only one goal, is to look at the destination address and find the existing interface. But so we are going to simplify everything inside the core network, and we are going to move complex things on the border of the network. So for instance, in IPv4 you can do fragmentation on the router. In IPv6, this will be forbidden. So we will see that a router now just forward packets. So here, it's an IPv4 packet. So you know the different fields. So what we are going to do in IPv6 is first is to, is to suppress fields that don't, are not really used in IPv4. So you know that IPv4 was designed in the 80s, and now we have 30 years of usage of IPv4. So things that looked good 30 years ago, now are not so good. So the first thing that looks to be a good idea, and in fact is not, is the option field. So why it's a mist is not a, a good field or is not well implemented? It's because if you look at how a router is built, you have a switching matrix. And on that switching matrix, you put a card. So you can put a network card. So network card is a special specialized hardware that will receive packets, process them, and find an existing interface. This is done by hardware, and the card can process simultaneously several packets that arrive to your router. Of course, they can be done on one card, or you can exchange information with another card. So I receive a packet here, I send it to the switching matrix, and the packet goes to another card, and is sent away. So all this process is done in parallel. So, now, so what do router is they look at the header, and if they find an header with value 4, here, of course IPv4, and value 5 here to say that there is no option, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 more are set it to bit, then the router will process the packet by hardware. But if you put option in the packet, you will not have 5 anymore here, but you will have another value, let's say 8. So in that case, the packet is sent to a supervision card. So this card is, can be viewed as a PC that manages your router. So on this supervision card, you have routing protocols, you have uh, SNMP, so you have management of the router, etc. So you have a lot of process. And when a packet with options arrive in a the router, so it goes to the supervision card, and here you have a software that will process a packet and then find the existing interface and send it to the appropriate card to be sent over. So this process is quite efficient. So if you send one packet, you will not notice a lot of difference. The big difference is here that 
everything is still your life. It means that if you receive at the same time several packet instructions, you cannot process them in parallel, but you have to process them one by one on your router. It means that this way you decrease the performance of the formatting process. So, what happened? We enter in the kind of vicious uh, circle because network manufacturer or uh, router manufacturer optimize the process for packet without option. So here you have good hardware. And since nobody uses option, they say that option will be put only uh, will be processed only by the supervision, supervision card. Now, you are the user of the network. You know that if you put option in your packet, this packet will be delayed in routers. So what do you do? You don't use option. And if you don't use option, of course, router manufacturers say, we made the good choice because option are not used, so it's not, we don't have to optimize them. So, little by bit, little, you always see packet without option in IPv4. So, there is some options that are very useful, but we cannot use them because it's hard to implement. So, in IPv6, what we are going to do is to suppress option in a packet. So, we will not have different size for either the header will always have the same fixed size. So it will simplify processing inside routers. As I said, some options were good, but not well implemented, so we will put them in what we call extensions. And we will see how we process extension in IPv6. It's not the same way, and it's more efficient. The second thing that has uh, been suppressed from IPv6, uh, IPv4 header, when you look at IPv6, is the fragmentation. So fragmentation is something mandatory. Because at layer 3, you don't have to know, you don't, don't have to know the layer 2 specificities. So for example, if you are in a Wi-Fi network, you can send packet, for example, a packet of two kilobytes on your Wi-Fi network, and you arrive to a standard Ethernet network, and in a standard Ethernet network, you can send only packet of 1.5 kilobytes information. So, how to do interconnection? So, if you do bridging, it will not work because the frames are not the same size. But at routing level, it must work. So what says IPv4? In the early days of IPv4, they say that if you send a packet which is too big for the next interface, then the router will have to cut it in two parts and send fragments to the destination. So this is a complex, uh, a complex problem because you receive a packet. This packet has a header and data and is too big. So you have to cut the packet to what we call MTU, maximum transmission unit of the next interface. And the remaining block, you have to add also an IPv6 header. And you have, in IPv4, to modify bits in this field. It means that the router is not only doing forwarding, but is doing complex things. So in IPv4, people suggest not to use this method. And in fact, normally now, your system, if you look at a packet you send on your Windows or on your Mac, then when you send a packet, you have a bit in the flat part, don't fragment, and you put it equal to 1. So what does it mean? 
It means that the router, when it receives this packet, and this packet can be forwarded on the other network, then the router sends back an ICMP message telling that the packet is too big and the size expected is 1,500 bytes. And you, you will do your fragmentation by yourself and you will send a packet of 100 and 1,500 and then a packet of 500 bytes. So, this is one, uh, one possibility to do fragmentation. So, in IPv6, this behavior will become the only possible behavior. So, we will say router cannot fragment. Fragmentation will be done by the source of the packet. So, this will simplify the implementation of the router because the router doesn't have to deal with fragmentation. For example, now you can imagine, you can say, okay, now if I look at all my laptops in IPv4, they always send a packet with bit DF equal to 1. So I am a router manufacturer, so I don't have to care about fragmentation in my IPv4 router. This is not true, because you will always find the old computer that sends packet with done fragment equal to zero, so you will have to process this on your router. So in IPv4 6, there is no more ambiguity because there is no more fragmentation. By no more fragmentation by router. Fragmentation can be done by the source, and we will see that there is an extension in IPv6 that allows to, uh, to carry extension parameter, but in a fragmentation parameter. In fact, fragmentation is not very often, because if you are using TCP, TCP will do the fragmentation. You will need only this fragmentation extension when you are sending large UDP packets. So it's not so common. So since it's not so common, it's totally stupid also to have this on every header. We, don't, we would like to have it only when it's needed. So that's why it's suppressed from IPv6 either. Then, we have another field that is not very useful in uh, IPv4 either, is checksum. So, it looks strange. Because checksum is something that is present everywhere, and guarantee that there is no problem during the transition. But if you look at modern technologies, you don't care about checksum because you have a layer 2, and this layer 2 has a CRC. So if you have a transmission error, the CRC will detect it. And so the layer 3 will never see the, check, the, the packet with an error. So here there is no problem. The second reason is that if you have some routers, not hardware routers, but routers, software, software routers, checking the checksum when you receive a packet is a very complex task. Because you have to add all the field of your either, make the sum, and verify that it's okay. So you have to access to a lot of memories to do that. So normally what some checksum some uh, but also checksum has to be changed. Because each time you cross a router, you decrement PTL. And to live will be decremented, and so checksum will have also to be decremented. So, what does some routers is that they decrement TTL and they just decrement checksum. And if there is no error, if there is an error on the checksum, they will not check it. They will just decrement the, the checksum and forward the packet. So, 
Checksum is takes some time in order to be processed. And the only, so we saw that there is no risk on a link because we have a layer 2 now that protects from errors. The only case when we can have errors, and you have a cosmic ray that goes into the memory of your router and change a 0 to a 1. So if your memory is not protected, you will not detect this, and maybe one bit of your destination address will be changed and you will send the packet to another destination. So this is not so often. So it's not necessary to carry on every packet a checksum. So we will not have checksum at layer 3 in IPv6 either. But we will make mandatory a checksum at layer 4. And in fact, the IP, TCP IP model is not like the OSI model. If you are thinking about OSI model, you will say that at layer 4, I have some information, but I don't have the IPv, IPv4 either. In fact, it's not true. At layer 4, in the TCP IP model, you have already the IPv4, IPv6, but here IPv4 either, and you have, of course, your, for example, TCP either. So layer 4 will put all the fields of your TCP either, but we also add some information at layer 3. For example, destination address, source address, protocol, length of the packet will be filled by layer 4. And all the remaining fields are equal to 0. And when we do a checksum at layer 4, in fact, this checksum will be on SATA, layer 4 either, but also layer 3 either. So it means that here, if I have a mistake on my destination address, when I receive, so first, the sender of compute is checksum, the packet is sent on the network, and the checksum is not checked on the network, it arrives to the destination, and the destination will receive the packet at layer 4, and will check the checksum. So if I have a transmission error on the destination, then it will be detected by the destination. So, always the same process. We put complex things on the border of the network, and in the core network, we do almost nothing, since we just do for one. So we simplified a lot how we can implement the route. So here we have the remaining fields. These fields will continue to be here in IPv6. So the first one is the version number. So in IPv4, it was 4, good. And in IPv6, it will be 6. And we will continue to have the rest of the field, but not with the same name and not at the same location. So for example, if serve, We'll see that in RAIN when you, you will study quality of service. So this cell will be moved a little bit from 4 bit and will be close to the version number. Packet length will become payload length. So it's almost the same, but here in packet length, maybe before you measure also the size of the leader. With data length, you just add the length of that. Then, next is the protocol field. So in IPv4, protocol field tells you which protocol you have above. So it can be TCP, UDP, ICMP, etc. etc. So in IPv6, protocol will be called next header. But you will find also the same value, 6 for TCP, 11, uh, 17 for UDP, etc. etc. But we will have also something else. It will be also extension. 
So we we'll have value here that will be reserved for extension. And just after the header, we can find either layer 4 or some extension. Then you have time to live. Time to live is, uh, will continue to be used the same way, but time to live is not a good thing. Because time to live means how many seconds you can stay on the network. And in fact, it is the number of routers you can cross. So the new name will be up limit. And then, you have source and destination address, and you will multiply it by 4. And here, this way, you have an IPv6 packet. There is only one part here that is missing, and this part will contain a new field that you don't have in IPv4. It's called FlowNavet. And currently, we don't know how what to do with this thing. It's something that has been invented uh, so 15 years ago when IPv6 was developed and at this time we had another vision of networking. In fact, at, at this time there was a cold war between, a cold war between uh, IETF and ATM4. So ATM was claiming that he was able to carry things with quality of service or flows with quality of service on the network. And they were saying that IP was a stupid protocol that was only able to do best effort. And so, at this time, we had a vision of network that is different of what we are doing right now because at the time we believe in micro flow. What is a microflow? It's a flow that a computer or equipment generates and will be processed, will be known by all the, all the devices, all the nodes inside the network. So here, for example, I open a phone call between two equipment and all the routers here are aware about the phone call and try to enhance the quality of this phone call. So this is very telephony oriented network because when you open in a, uh, in a normal telephony network, when you open a circuit, all the switches are aware of this thing. So now, so that's why we, we need a flow level. It's to identify flows in the middle of your network. Normally a flow in IP is given by five values. Source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and protocol. So a router in the middle that would like to identify a flow will have to look at source address, it's very easy, it's here. Destination address, very easy, it's here, in the IPv6 header. Uh, protocol, it's here, it's next header. But, source port and destination ports are very difficult to find. Because they can be just after the IPv6 header. But after the IPv6 header, I can have extension and my TCP header with port and source port and destination port will be far away from my IPv6 header. So I will have to look at how this extension is built to find TCP. And of course, we don't want that. We want router to be fast as possible. So, what was the first use of Clonavel is to make a, an abstract of source port and destination port and you put it here at the beginning of your IPv6 header. So now to identify your flow is very simple. 
I look at the source address. I look at the flow level. The source must generate this value of the flow level for only one flow. And this way, I can identify a flow easily inside the network. So that's a theory. In practice, it's not used. Because nowadays we don't see network with microflow. What do we have now? It's macroflow, macroflow. It means that we are going to aggregate a lot of flows coming from, for example, your company, and you will have a hedge router here that will detect flows from your company, and for example, will use an MPLS circuit to send all the information on that circuit. So it means that inside your network, in the middle, you will have a lot of packets that doesn't have anything in common on their header either. Because the decision to belong to the same micro micro flow is not because some bits in the header, but because the edge router has decided to group all this information in one flow. So here, of course, flow label is not very useful because flow label is selected by the source. And here, we don't care because it's something that is selected by an element in the middle. So that's why maybe flow label is the first bad idea of IPv6. Because we don't know how to use it. The only interest of flow label is that it maintains an element on 64 bytes. So this way you can process it quite easily. You don't have your source address and destination address is adding on the boundary of 64 bytes. So, there is some attempt currently at the ATF to define some way to use flow level, for example, to do load balancing between routers or something like that. But this is still experimental. And currently, most of your flow, the packet you will see in the 6 network, are zeros here. OK? So, that's our IPv6. So, I, I took about all of these things. Ah, yes. Another, the only device that currently look at source port on destination port are firewalls. Okay? So, when you send a packet, firewall will look at the packet and then know if it's correct or not. So we will see that the work of firewall may be more complex in IPv6, because in IPv4, in fact, it's very simple. You have your IPv4 packet with source address, destination address, and then just after, you have TCP or UDP with source port and destination port. Here, of course, the firewall has to understand all the chaining of extension. So that's a more complex job uh, here for, for Firewall. So, we are going to see now IPv6 extensions. So, it's uh, something very tricky, so we are going to see that on example. This example is not very well chosen because now it's deprecated. But I think it's the best way to, to understand how it works. So what is important to know, to notice, is that extension, except one, up by up, the other one are not seen by the network. I, uh, so if they are considered as linear for protocol. So in, in, a core, in a core network, router will just look at the header. So we can say that IPv4 is layer 3, TCP is layer 4, so extension can be a kind of 3.5 layer that is between layer 4 and layer 3. So you have a, a lot of uh, 
You have several uh, extensions that have been defined. You have one which has the strange behavior is up by up, because up by up is processed by every router. So here it's the same behavior as the extension in IPv4. So sometimes it's useful, but here currently there is not a lot of up by up extension defined, so I will skip it. The other one are defined here. You have five extensions, and that's all. One is destination, so it's to carry information to a destination, and before being processed by layer 4. So we will see an example when I will show you an example of mobility. You have routing, so routing you can do source routing, it's used also for mobility. Fragmentation, so fragmentation will contain the information we have suppressed from the IPv4 header, and we will find this information in this extension. And you have two extensions, authentication and security. These one are used by IPC. So they are the same as the one you may know on IPC. It means that I'm sending a packet on the internet. And this packet is too big for this router. So here, for example, I have IPv6 and UDP. And my UDP path here is very, very large. So I send this on the router. It can cross some router that accept the sign, but this one refuse this packet. So this router will send me an ICMP message. Let's say that the size will, will be 100 uh, bytes. Okay? So what do I do? I take my IPv6 header. I put then a fragmentation extension. And I put a fragment of my original UDP message. And then I generate, so I'm sending that, and it crosses the router because the size is correct. And then I generate another packet with a fragmentation option, and I put the remaining of my UDP packet. And I send it on the router. Yeah, all extension except up by up, are for the client and for the destination. It means that here, all the router will just see normal packets. But the receiver will see that there is a fragmentation here. So we'll not give directly the information to layer 4, but we'll wait for all the fragments, and when he will have received all the fragments, he will give the whole packet, the whole message to layer 4. In the case with TCP. So that's why I have chosen UDP. Because with UDP it's not so obvious because when you are with UDP, for example, I have an application that sends uh, 8K kilobyte frame of information to my UDP layer. So what I will do is to send this packet on the network. This packet will be lost because it's too big. So I will receive an ICMP message telling me that this packet is just too big. But my application will continue to send me 8 kilobytes. I cannot tell to my application, reduce your size. So since I cannot tell it, I just memorize that for the destination MTU equal, let's say, one uh, kilobyte. And the next time I will receive eight kilobyte from my application, I will split that into eight fragments. Okay? So here, it's because I cannot 
manage what is coming from uh, outside. Now, I am in TCP. In TCP, is, you know that TCP is view like a ribbon, and you cut your ribbon and you send a segment. So let's say that here I send a kilobyte segment. Here, so I send this a kilobyte segment, and I will never receive acknowledgement for this segment because the packet is lost. In fact, I will receive an ICMP message from a router that says, I have discarded your packet because it was too big. So what do I do here? I take, I have not lost the information because I was waiting for acknowledgement before removing it from my memory. So now I take one kind of segment and I send it and then tell it. And then I receive the hack so I can remove it from my memory. So here is what you say. For TCP, I will not use the fragmentation either, either because my TCP layer can memorize, bufferize information and process it differently. UDP is purely that I am, so I will receive information and send it and erase it from my memory. But here, for the next frame or next message, I will be ready to cut it into pieces. One simple either, so it's the simplest one. The one you will see most of the time when you are using IPv6. So it's IPv6 either. And in the next either field, you will have 6. And 6 means that the upper layer is TCP. And then you will have that. Uh, the other one, for example, here, I put next either equal booting. And then I have routing, and here next either with BTCP, etc. And here, in fact, in routing either, I will have the length of the routing either. So this way I can find where I start the TCP either. And for example, I can do something like this, where I put routing, then fragmentation, then, uh, sorry, so here I'm pointing routing, then routing with point fragmentation, and fragmentation with point TCP. So it's not a good example with TCP, because we have seen that we don't need fragmentation with TCP. Okay, so we are going to see a old extension, extension that has been removed now from specification. I will tell you why after. But you have other version of this extension that uh, can be used. So, we are going to do source routing. You know what is source routing? So, source routing means that you are going to send a packet to a destination, but you want to cross some routers on your path. So, for example, I want to go from Mexico to, to France, but I want to cross router in uh, the US, this router, this router. I want to go to Germany and back to France. So I can impose a kind of route on, uh, on the path. So you have a source. So in IPv4, how it works? In IPv4, you will have an option. And here, in the destination address, so you are in host A, you want to cross router A1, and you want to reach B. And of course, in the middle, you have a lot of routers that allow you to reach A1, and here you have routers that allow you to reach B. So does it work in IPv4? I have an extension. So I have 4 EC, something that is higher than 5, because I have options. Here I put A1 as a destination. And in the options, I put the real destination B. And I send the packet on the network. So what happened? Here in IPv4, this router will look at the packet and will say, mm, this packet has an option, so I cannot process it directly, so I, put, I, put, I give this packet to my supervision card. The supervision card 
process the packet, see nothing special. It says I'm not there one. So I'm sending to the next stop. So the next stop will delay a little bit the packet, etc. Et until I arrive to R1. And R1 will say, okay, this either is for one or me because I see R1 here, this is my address. So I will swap and I will put the destination here. I put R1 on the pointer to say that I have passed And then I send it again my packet, and this packet will be slowed down by all the router I pass because there is option. In IPv6, I will not process the same one. In IPv6, I will generate an header, IPv6 header, with the destination of N1. And I will have a protocol value that will tell me that is routing header. So this will be viewed as layer 3.5. But for the network, it's like a layer 4. And then, I will have my layer 4. So here in my extension header, I will put here that I want to reach B. So I'm sending this packet on the network. And all, for all the router here, the goal is just to send the packet to R1. OK? Because here, what they say, they see something with their one, and say, okay, it's so I one. So they are forwarding a packet, like a normal packet, to that destination. Here, the destination say, okay, L1, it's me. So I have to push it to the upper layer. And the upper layer is the extension putting it there. So here, the routing header, what we'll do, we will show up addressing and re forward the packet to R B. So all these router will see just the packet to B. B receives the packet, say that all give it to the extension header. Extension header or routing uh, routing header see that we have finished the list of router we want to cross. So it will give it to layer 4. So it means that here, we don't delay the packet in all of the router here because it's viewed as a normal packet. So here you see the advantage of extension. Another advantage of extension compared to IPv4 is that I have no limit in the size of the extension. My extension can be all the whole packet size. Okay? And that's where we have got a problem with this extension. Because, what happens? For example, you have IPv6 on your 3G phone. So you have your iPhone here with IPv6 on it and with routing capability. And here you have Telmex uh, mobile network, and here you have a router. And I send a packet to you. Let's say so we have here, call it I for iPhone and R for router. So I send a packet to I, but with extension either, that will be R, I, R, I, R. So what will happen? The packet will arrive to R. R say okay, I have to send it to I. I will give it to the extension header or the routing header. And here we say, oh, it's for R. R will say no, it's for I. R say no, it's for I. Etc. etc. And you send your packet a lot of times on the unit. So there are two advantages, or one advantage and one drawback. The advantage is for Telmex, because you will pay for a lot of traffic, because you are sending this packet a lot of time on the radio interface. 
So you know, 10 meg, 300 meg. But it will also saturate the network. And here is something, remember yesterday, we talked about DOS attack, dynamic of service attacks, and we said that when you send a packet on the network, you must have only one answer. You cannot generate more packets. And here I send one packet on the network, and I generate plenty of packets on the network. So it means that here, it can be used to overload a link. Because one packet will be multiplied, and so, and of course, a radio link is more obvious than in optical fiber. So that's why this extension that it was has a zero value, so a lot of people call it RH0, has been uh, suppressed from the standard. So you cannot use it right now. But, but uh, it's a shame for this, but source routing is uh, something very useful. So you are now, I think, specialist of uh, mobile IP. No? Yes? You have seen it with Nicola? Yes? So, did you talk about uh, this extension IPv6 for mobile IP? Don't remember? Okay. So, let let's have a look. So now you know the principle of mobile IP. So you have a correspondent node. But want to join a mobile node somewhere. And so it doesn't know where you are. So we send it to uh, your home address on your own network. Okay? And here you have home agent that tunnel the traffic to one the mobile. Okay? So now some people don't like this because here you don't optimize the communication. So what people would like to do is to send a binding update to the correspondent node and say now send me the traffic directly. So here you have your address and here you have your care of it. So how can I do that? If I send now home correspondent node to care of address, I will break TCP connection. Because TCP identify a flow, and a flow that I have established with my correspondent node is correspondent node to home address with this port and this port. So now if I change home address with care of address, it will not. So to follow this, we are going to use to send the IPv6 header. This IPv6 header will be with the care of address. And then I will send a routing header, so here it's called RH2, and I will put here only one address, which is a home address. So there is no the security problem we had in the previous field, because it's here, I can only put one address. And then I will put my TCP header. So this way, the IPv6 packet is sent to the mobile node. And the mobile node receives the packet of the of address, send it to the routing header, and the routing header change the care of address with a more address, suppress this because we are at the end, and give it to TCP. And TCP will see home address. So for the TCP layer, we have not moved. For the IP layer, we have moved. So this way you can play with two addresses. The answer, for the answer, we have the same problem. We can imagine that I can send a packet here 
to the correspondent node, let's say, home address uh, toward the correspondent node. So I send this packet here. And normally, since routing is only done on the destination address, this packet will arrive and the correspondent node will not notice on the grid. So this is not true. More and more provider will filter this message because the source address is not an official one. This is done to avoid uh, security problem, DOS of attack problem. So you re remember uh, yesterday I told you that I want to attack uh, IPN. So I was saying a packet with IPN source address and to, uh, to some, uh, some multicast address. And then I receive a lot of answer, but the answer doesn't come back to me, but goes to UPN. So here, to avoid this kind of thing, my provider will check if I have the right to use EPN address as an official address. And if it's not the case, my packet will be discarded. So here, this is you as an attack. Because here, I don't have the good source address. So what I will do here, it's about the same, but on the source address. So here I put my care of address, because my care of address is legal here. And I will add a destination header. And my destination header will contain the home address. And then I will have my layer 4. So this way, at layer 2, at layer 3, sorry, the packet is legal. So here, the destination is correspondent node. The packet is sent on the network, reach the correspondent node. The correspondent node will see that we have to send it to the destination address. And then here, we'll change it by home address. We'll remove it, and we'll give it to layer 4. And layer 4 will not notice mobility. Okay? So here, it's a very efficient way to play with address. So, one question. Here, I put fragment after routing. We will have the same thing if I put fragment before. Now, in fact, in that case, if I put routing before fragment, all my intermediary router will never see this fragment. Because, remember, I will just switch toward the address and forward the packet again. So if I put fragmentation after routing, it means that I'm sending all the fragments, all the fragments are forwarded, and only the destination, final destination, will reassemble all the fragments to make the message. Now, if I do fragment routing, if I put fragmentation before routing, so what will happen here? So, I send my fragment, it arrives on the first router, and the first router will see fragmentation header and its address. So this router will reassemble all the fragments to make a message, and then we'll do source routing and we'll send the packet on another link. And here maybe it will have to do fragmentation again. Okay, so in terms of performances, the first one is better because in the second case, you have to wait your fragment here and wait your fragment there. In the other case, you just have to wait a fragment at only one place. But for example, imagine that you have a very small network and then you know that you are going to a very large network, or network with large MTU, then maybe it's better to say, okay, I go to that router, here I reassemble all my packet, my fragment, and then I send it on the other network. 
So you have a different behavior depending the location of your extension. So it's not uh, totally uh, invisible, the place where you put extension. But don't worry, currently you will never see this kind of extension. The only extension you can see in IPv6 in operational network is fragmentation from time to time and IPsec. So authentication and cipher. But the rest, routing a uh, mobile app are not very useful. Okay, so I propose you to have a break right now and then we have a look at a new protocol which is ICMPv6 